listening to Abstract Bioscience, a podcast about new and exciting research in biological sciences taking place across the Norwich Research Park and beyond. I'm Michael Pointer and I'm James Bregan. This time I've teamed up with James, who hosts the Heredity Journal podcast, to bring you the highlights from this year's Pop Group conference. Pop Group is the annual meeting of the Population Genetics Group of the Genetics Society, and this year the conference was hosted in Norwich as a collaboration between the Earlham Institute, the John Innes Centre and the University of East Anglia. Well, I say in Norwich, but unfortunately, the surge in winter COVID cases put paid to that, and it was actually hosted on Zoom and Twitter. But that didn't detract from the quality of the science on display. So sit back and experience just a taste of the incredible diversity of research presented at this year's conference, as we hear from the outstanding plenary speakers and prize winning students. But before we get into that, it's important to recognise the incredible effort that goes into organising an event like this. So to start with, I spoke to two of the organisers, Dr. Mark McMullen from the Earlham Institute and Professor Dave Richardson from the University of East Anglia. So you're nearly a week out from hosting an online conference. I thought it was great. How did it feel from your side of the table? My genuine perspective is that it went really well. The numbers in the conference stayed high. It was, it was really well attended. I was really pleased with that. The numbers in each room stayed high. And the, the questions were kind of, you know, they were always there. You know, this sort of drain, the brain drain at the end of the day didn't really come. So I feel like it went really well. I don't know what you feel, Dave. Um, yeah, I think it academically it went very well. And I think that's partly because we got the balance right on a few things. Like a few of the conferences I've been to online have been a bit too heavy, a bit too intense. I think by having a less crowded timetable, slightly longer breaks for questions, slightly more breaks, allowed people time to reflect and to ask questions. Um, And so that worked well, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it definitely wasn't as grueling as some of the other online conferences. The slots were sort of three or four talks long, weren't they? And that was quite manageable. Yeah, people said that three talks in a slot was about right and they could Mm. keep their concentration. And even technically, it seemed like it went pretty smoothly. If I had a discussion point about platforms and linked to the Twitter, yes, I think the Twitter presentations went really well. I actually prefer them to posters. Mm -hmm. But I wish there'd been some way to integrate that more with the main Zoom level conferences. I don't know how you would do it, but uh, maybe someone presenting the tweets very quickly could be done. But I like the fact that, you know, when you do those Twitter presentations, it really allows a very graphic exploration of of a paper or, or a study, and it's out there. So people from the other conferences can see it. You can get feedback for a lot longer than just doing a poster presentation. Yeah, it includes a lot more of your community as well. Like if you're linking in collaborators or in the case of a PhD student with me, it was industrial collaborators, they can see that that's going on. And a poster in a conference is quite well exposed within that set of people, but actually its reach is completely restricted to that conference. And the reach of these tweets, and they're quite, they were really nice. They're really kind of detailed in the sense that you can really dig into things because everything's quite well linked but also bite size that you can kind of just read through them. It's a, it's a really nice format. I think future conferences with posters should consider having those as well or ha- having something like that. Yeah. yeah for next the time. other thing we got a lot of good feedback, mainly from conference people, was putting the early career researchers talks before the plenaries. That really got a lot of a big buzz around it, actually. Yeah, I thought that was a really nice idea. Yeah, when you realise that the the student that won the best talk last year was suddenly talking to like 350 people at the beginning of a conference, that was pretty big. Mm. Yeah, that was, I was kind of excited and nervous for them. What an opportunity. I I really loved that. And one of the things I love about Pop Group actually is the way that it kind of gets a little bit of a flavour of the place and the people that organise it. And so I wouldn't want to make anything about pop group prescriptive because it's nice that each new iteration is slightly different, but 
oh, I'd love to see more of that. I really would. Mm. Yeah, I interviewed Anna Hewitt, who won the Student Talk Prize mm -hmm. this year, and she was uh, both excited and terrified at the prospect that that might happen next year. We'll hear from Anna Hewitt in just a bit. But first of all, let's explore some of the biggest talks at Pop Group, the plenaries. Plenaries are invited talks that bring the entire conference together. And this year, like always, they showcased an incredible range of scientific endeavour. Let's start by hearing from the two plenary speakers who presented on the first day of the conference, Dr. Alex Sue from the University of East Anglia and Professor Eva Stukenbrock from the University of Kiel. Thanks for talking to me this morning, Alex. So you gave the first plenary of the meeting. What was it that you spoke about? So I guess the overall title of the talk was the germline soma genome differences. Uh, why should we bother to eliminate DNA? I don't, I don't know if it was the exact title like that, but basically the topic of some weird animals that have been known for sometimes quite some time actually to have differences in their germline DNA. So the cells that are basically coming from parental generation and then get passed on to the next generation, which are the gonads through gametes basically, versus the soma, which are being then the body cells basically, everything else of the body that is in a sense then mortal cells. So this very extreme germline soma genome differences have been reported, for example, in a bunch of nematodes, but also some uh, dipteran insects, some lampreys, for example, and also some birds, for example. At the end of the day, these are very noticeable or striking differences. You can see them under the microscope when you watch the inheritance of these chromosomes to, between different cells of the same body, for example. So they change either in size or shape or number. And so kind of based on that, I would almost predict that this is really something that might be existing in way more organisms out there simply because it's maybe not as noticeable in many other organisms. And in the context of what I was talking about as a main system, so in that talk, I talked mainly about the songbird germline restricted chromosome system that my group is working on. So in this case, basically, the DNA that is eliminated is on an entire chromosome, one single chromosome that is eliminated during the germline soma differentiation. We don't know how that happens, but we basically know the outcome that when you're an adult bird, you never have this chromosome in a somatic cell, be it blood cell, muscle, liver, whatnot, basically. But if you then look at uh, um, gonad cells, so spermatogonia, for example, and oogonia, you will find the germline restricted chromosome in there. And I guess in this specific example, so this was already identified in a beautiful cytogenetic study now 24 years ago, so quite some time ago, actually. And then, don't know exactly how long, but something like 10 years after, or within the 10 years after that, it was found in a second bird species, the Bengali finch, a very close relative. And only within the last... Now, three years, basically, it's been shown that this chromosome very likely exists in all songbirds, if not all pastoring birds. And so basically this, this whole phenomenon went from being kind of a niche topic of maybe just a handful of species to now at least 5,000 species, if not 6,000, 6,500 species of birds. So it's still rather likely that it does not exist outside of songbirds or pastoral reformers because a couple of species have been looked at so far. But whatever that means for, for the ancestral states across birds or across vertebrates, of course, for this phenomenon, I think it's just interesting to see that, that some of these phenomena just often have not been looked at simply, I guess, because we, we take those strange things always with, with a grain of salt. So my name is Eva Stubenbrock. I'm an evolutionary biologist uh, based at the University of Kiel in the north of Germany. I am originally from Denmark have spent some years abroad living in Brazil and in Switzerland. And the last couple of years, I've been based in uh, Germany. Perfect. And I wonder if you could just tell us a bit about your research and what it was that you presented at Pop Group. Yeah, so my research has been dealing with fungi that associate with plants. And uh, my very early research focused on mycorrhizal fungi that are beneficial or mutualistic symbionts of plants. And um, the last couple of years we've been focusing on plant pathogenic fungi and how they evolve, how they adapt to the coexistence with the plant host. And so at the pop group meeting here, I had the pleasure of presenting some of our more recent research on a fungal pathogen called Cymosoptoria tritici, a pathogen of uh, wheat. And we have been working on unraveling the evolutionary history of this pathogen and also understanding rates of adaptation of this pathogen. One of the questions we're interested in is if agriculture actually accelerate rates of adaptation in this organism here. What was it you were really hoping the audience listening were going to take away? So one thing is that today we can, with the situation of the pandemic, every day we actually read about genetic variants of uh, SARS-CoV-2, read, read about dynamics uh, in space and time of genetic variants. And I think that 
is a very good example of how important it is to study the evolutionary dynamic of uh, infectious disease causing agents. And just to make a link here, so that's sort of what we are trying to do um, for an agricultural pathogen. And this is, of course, something that has important applied aspect, but also is, uh, is a lot of fun in terms of understanding basic biology of this organism. And, uh, and a second thing I can mention here is that this fungus Cymoseptoria tridici also has a lot of interesting genetic features such as uh, selfish chromosomes and um, shows a lot of presence-absence dynamic and um, transposable element dynamics. So there's a lot of, let's say, interesting aspects of the population genetics and, and genetic mechanism per se in studying this organism here. Alex and Eva's talks were brilliant, and together they give a perfect example of the wide range of topics covered at Pop Group. And what they did on the first day, Professor Tom Connor from Cardiff University and Professor Scott Edwards from Harvard did on the last day. Here's Tom. So just as a bit of background, I, I have been a researcher and I, I work on uh, microbial populations. So I'm interested in, in how populations vary in time and space, how pathogens move, essentially sort of uh, genomic epidemiology, but asking a whole range of questions about the microbial populations themselves. And since 2016, I've, I've spent a considerable amount of my time working for the NHS in Wales as part of our National Public Health Agency, Public Health Wales. And that work has seen me taking uh, a lot of my research experience and, and research that's going on in the field and turning that into clinical services, which are then used on an individual level to manage patients and, and on a population level to provide a sort of more precise public health, what we call precision health care. And during my talk, I went through uh, some of what we've been doing. I picked out two examples. So um, I picked out the example of C. difficile. So C. difficile is a uh, hospital acquired infection. It's um, a significant problem in hospitals. It causes a significant number of infections each year in hospitals, which is something that we want to try and get a handle on. And I talked about how we are using population genomics to support infection prevention and control efforts and how we're, we're using uh, various analyses to generate information which can be linked with other epidemiological data to control and respond to outbreaks in hospitals. And then I went on to talk about uh, our SARS-CoV-2 work, so the work that we've been doing over the last couple of years, which went from a sort of a standing start to building a, a sort of a comprehensive genomic surveillance system that enables us to analyse what's happening in a hospital or what's happening on a ward, all the way up to looking at things like imports of, of SARS-CoV-2 into Wales or into the UK. So, so using sort of genome sequence data as a building block to be able to then sort of undertake modular analyses at a range of different scales to answer different questions that we need to answer as part of the pandemic response. My name is Scott Edwards. I'm an evolutionary biologist from Harvard University, and I'm also the curator of ornithology in the Museum of Comparative Zoology at Harvard. Perfect. Um, and you were one of the plenary speakers this year. And I wonder if you could just tell us a bit about your research and what it was that you presented at Pop Group. Well, I'm uh, an evolutionary biologist first, I suppose, but second, I'm an ornithologist. That means I study birds. And so the research I presented at Pop Group was on some new work I've done, all unpublished, trying to look at what we call the pan genome of a group of birds known as scrub jays. These are birds that live in the US and North America. And I chose them because I wanted to find a group that had within a species or between closely related species, lots of variation in the effective population size, with some parts having you know, big populations with lots of variation, others having very little variation. And then this gets to the pangenome part. The pangenome is sort of the collection of all the genetic variation collected in a way that's unbiased with regard to a reference genome. You know, much of population genetics today and, and in human genetics in particular is, is biased by our use of a so-called reference genome. This is when we choose sort of arbitrarily an individual to serve as the point of comparison of other individuals in our population. Of course, that's not going to work because we're going to lose a lot of variation that's not present in that reference individual. By looking at a pan genome, we proceed in a sort of reference-free approach in which no individual is a specific reference. We're just collecting all the variation, whether it be single nucleotide polymorphisms or uh, structural variants such as insertions and deletions or inversions. Anyway, and so we've taken a pan genome approach with these scrub jays, and our goal is to understand the fitness effects of 
structural variants, insertions, deletions, and inversions. And by looking at the dynamics of these structural variants in large population size species and small population size species, we can sort of have a comparison there and see how uh, variants are behaving in those two scenarios. Anyway, that's a long way of saying we were presenting some new research unpublished on uh, some great birds in the U.S. trying to learn something about fundamental processes of microevolution. Fantastic. And I guess people will have to wait for those publications to come out. But I wonder what you think the sort of key take homes, the audience listening, were going to take away. Well, the first thing I wanted them to take away was that looking at the pan genome requires some new approaches that aren't very common yet in population genetics. First of all, we've got to, you know, proceed in a, such a way that we're able to assemble each genome in our panel de novo. In other words, we're not going to use a reference at all. And this often means that we have to use long read sequences on every individual, not just for a reference, but on every individual so that we can assemble each individual de novo. The second thing is that I hope they took away that there's a whole suite of new tools that were certainly unfamiliar to me uh, a year ago and may be unfamiliar to much of the audience that allows us to study genetic variation in a reference-free manner. Uh, and this, I think, would be of interest not just to ornithologists, of course, but to all uh, evolutionary biologists. Uh, and these are new statistical tools, new ways of generating so-called pan-genome graphs, uh, which are ways of capturing all the genetic variation in a population. And it's very exciting. And frankly, terra incognita, it's a very rapidly evolving field. And um, it's just very exciting. And then the last point I was hoping people would take away is that the pan-genome approach is not only novel from a technical standpoint, but is profoundly more inclusive, I would say, than our traditional approaches. Remember, our traditional way of doing uh, next generation pop gen is to take a reference individual and map on other individuals to that individual. Well, this is going to be biased. And sadly, I think it's already caused biases in fields that you know really matter for human health and well-being, such as medical genetics. By taking a pan-genome approach, we remove uh, many of those biases. And you know, I, I think the end product is frankly more inclusive. It's acknowledging that every individual in the study has an importance and there's no one individual that's more important than any others. And although when applied to birds, this might be sort of quaint, I think when applied to humans, it has a really quite a profound message that is a positive one. And that I think will be good, not only for the science, but for the well-being of people in general. And so those are the sort of the main takeaways I hope people got from my talk. The plenaries are amazing talks that bring the conference together as one to share a common experience. Another talk that did that was given by the most recent winner of the Sir Kenneth Mather Memorial Prize, Dr. Robert Hillary. This prize is given to a BSc, MSc or PhD student from a UK university or research organisation who has shown outstanding performance in the area of quantitative or population genetics. So my name is Robert Hillary and I'm a postdoctoral researcher at the Institute of Genetics and Cancer in Edinburgh and I did my PhD there too and I just finished this recently. I did this under the supervision of Riccardo Marioni and we mostly worked on dementia. And I myself come from County Clare in the west of Ireland from a farming background and science and academia weren't the obvious choice for me but I was very fortunate to be able to stick with it and I've really enjoyed starting as a postdoc. So I presented on my PhD thesis, and this was largely broken into two streams of research, but they were connected by trying to identify blood biomarkers of cognitive decline and brain disease. So the first stream of research was trying to understand why we all differ in our blood protein levels. And this matters because blood proteins are key drug targets and indicators of disease, such as dementia. In other words, they're biomarkers. So by understanding why we differ in our blood protein levels, we could not only be able to predict who's at higher risk of certain diseases like dementia, but we also might be able to prioritize certain drug targets that are likely to be successful in trials. So specifically, I focus on trying to understand the biological factors that drive these differences, such as genetic factors. And we combined all of this biological information into multiple algorithms in an effort to try and find blood proteins that causally associate with dementia. And we found two blood proteins where lower levels of the proteins might increase our risk of dementia. And the second stream of research focused on an exciting area of trying to predict people's biological age. So two people who have the same chronological age or candles on their birthday cake might have very different biological ages and risks for different diseases. And we're able to predict biological age by looking at a process in our cells called DNA methylation. 
and it's a process which switches genes on and off. So this can have a positive or detrimental effect on our health, depending on, on where it occurs. And also lifestyle factors such as smoking, drinking and exercise affect this process. And it's a major biological mechanism in which our lifestyle affects our health. So we can turn to machine learning methods to study people's patterns of DNA methylation and predict their biological age. A major biological aging measure came out in 2019 and it's called Grim Age. And it was named Grim Age because higher values meant grim news. It's a blood-based predictor of our risk of mortality, which can sound quite scary, but what it doesn't predict when we're going to die. It's simply just good at tracking people with poor health versus people with better health. And of course, those with poor health overall are likely to live fewer years than those with better health. What we found is that this predictor of biological age, grim age, also associates with poor brain health and it can predict the future onset of lung disease, heart disease and diabetes. And if I had one take home message based on my PhD, it's that looking at multiple types of biological data is better than looking at just one alone in terms of predicting our health and disease. Of course, it's not all invited speakers and a lot of the talks at Pop Group are given by early career researchers. To celebrate this, each year students who give the best talk and create the best poster are recognised with prizes. Although this year, the best poster has morphed into the best Twitter flash presentation. This year's student winners were Anna Hewitt from the University of Edinburgh and Harrison Ostridge. And somewhat remarkably, it turns out that these two actually sat next to each other in high school biology. Let's hear what they're up to now. Hi Anna, thanks for joining me. And first of all, big congratulations on winning the student talk prize. Was this your first pop group or are you a veteran? It's actually my second pop group, but the pop group last year was my first conference ever. So Mm -hmm. (laughs) first time presenting. So it feels very like full circle moment. Nice. First year, (laughs) first win. Yeah. (laughs) Uh, So what was it that you were speaking about? Um, So I was talking about uh, runs of homozygosity in the red deer on run. And um, I basically found these areas called uh, like ROH hotspots or runs of homozygosity hotspots. And I was sort of trying to determine what was causing these regions. So could it be like selection or recombination rate or population history? And I basically found that with doing some simulations in SLIM, that it's unlikely to be selection and much more likely to be just recombination or population history affecting the runs of homozygosity. Cool. Are they small populations then on an island? Um, so at the moment, there's like in the whole island, there's like a thousand deer, but they have like effective population size, like about 100, really. But they're all just stuck on this island. So there's <laughs> a bit of inbreeding mm-hmm. going on. <laughs> cool. Uh, I did see your talk and I wasn't really surprised that you won. It was really good. Oh, thank you. Yeah. means a lot. <laughs> yeah. yeah, no problem. Yeah. My name's Harrison Ostrich. I'm a PhD student at the UCL Genetics Institute in London, uh, and I'm supervised by Dr. Ida Andre of UCL and Dr. Jinliang Wang of the Institute of Zoology. You are the student winner of the Flash Twitter presentations. So I wonder if you could just tell us a bit about what it was that you presented. Sure, yeah. So I presented my PhD project, which is investigating local genetic adaptation in chimps. So basically, chimpanzees, along with bonobos, are our closest living relatives. Um, However, unfortunately, their numbers are declining with all four subspecies endangered or critically endangered. They live across sub-Saharan Africa, spanning many different habitats, providing the opportunity for local genetic adaptations. And by investigating patterns of local adaptation can tell us how chimps have adapted in the recent past and the selection pressures which are important for each population. But previously, we've been unable to study local adaptation in chimps because we've only had a relatively small number of genomic samples from individuals with unknown wild origins. So to address this, the PANAF consortium was set up to coordinate the collection of a huge amount of data on the chimps and their environment from across the range of all four subspecies, including 828 biological samples from wild individuals. So my project analyzes the genetic data from these new samples to investigate fine-scale local adaptation in chimps. And what we find is that SNPs with patterns consistent with local adaptation are enriched for virus response functions. So previously, we've identified ancient adaptation to viruses, and here we find evidence that viruses remain an important selection pressure in recent chimp evolution. Now, understanding patterns of adaptation to viruses has important implications for conservation, as 
viruses are a major source of mortality in wild chimps, and maybe also for medicine, because we find evidence of adaptation in many genes which are involved in response to viruses which also infect humans, such as Ebola viruses and SIV, which jumped into humans and became HIV. And the next stage of the project is going to bring in a wealth of information that we have on the environment of the chimps to test for genotype environment associations, to increase our power to detect selection to environmental variables and get a more complete picture of local adaptation in chimps. Thanks to everyone who took part in this episode. Of course, these interviews represent just a fraction of the research presented at Pop Group. That's right. And luckily, recordings of the talks are due to go up on the Pop Group website. That's populationgeneticsgroup.org.uk. And the Twitter Flash presentations can, of course, be found on Twitter. That's at Pop Group. That's all for this episode. Thanks for joining me, James. And we both hope you've enjoyed this peek inside Pop Group. And we'll hope to see you at next year's meeting. Links to all things Pop Group will be in the show notes at abstractbioscience.co.uk, where you can also find our social media information. If you like the kinds of things that I cover here, then I suggest you check out the Heredity podcast, where James is the regular host. I've been Michael Pointer. You can contact me at abstract.bioscience.podcast at gmail.com. Our excellent theme music is by Phoebe Troop. Look her up. Thanks for listening. Catch you next time.